So it's, it's all on order and that kind of deal. All right, 2 Corinthians. Um, I just, I can't thank you enough. It's just, uh, it's a big, it's a big deal. Now, uh, I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago when we started this that part of the reason that I'm doing this is, is because many people come to church here from other churches and it's because all they've known, excuse me, all they've known is what they came from and it's not because uh, they're stupid, it's because they're ignorant to what the Bible says about things. Many people go to churches and they go to churches and it basically is uh, um, a, a, like a, what do you call that, a collage of whoever happens to be running everything. And so they try to make it something for everybody instead of what the Bible says you should expect in a church. And so then you come here and it seems to have a little bit more form, a little more shape, a little bit more continuity of how we do, what we do, why we do it, the way we do it, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, you could almost say about our church is we go by the KISS theory. Um, and that's, this is what I was taught, is just keep it simple, stupid. So uh, the, the more simplistic it is, the easier it is for you to grab a hold of and understand. When you get too many plates turning at one time, you're not effective at doing that. Many people nowadays think that I should be, in a sense, uh, multitasking. Well, if you multitask too much, you lose your ability to be effective at one or two things. You know, well, I'm doing 10 things at one time. Yeah, but you're probably not doing all 10 on them to the best of your ability. The world you're living in today pushes you into this idea that the more things you have going, the more successful you are. No, you're just spread a lot thinner. Um, you know, finding out what the Lord wants you to do and doing it, that's what becomes important for you. And so what I'm trying to do is go through, take a passage out of 2 Corinthians 4 here to give you an idea so that you understand when you come to church what it is you can expect church to be like and or what you can expect the preaching to be like. Uh, many of you have come here from other churches and when you hear the way that we preach here, it's odd to you, especially if you came from Catholic or Episcopalian background and the guy gets up even back before, even if he's no longer doing it in Latin, uh, he basically has what's called a homily and he gets up and he reads it to you and maybe makes a couple of comical comments and he keeps pretty much everything at a monotone. And here it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes uh, Sunday school can, you know, kind of break out of the box or maybe like last Sunday, things get a little bit uh, more uh, exciting and people shout and that kind of a deal, but nobody's doing, you know, holy rolling and, you know, getting slain in the spirit and none of that. I find that the reason that oftentimes that people are critical is simply because they don't understand. And so oftentimes what they'll do is, is because they don't understand, they want to put a label on it so that they can compartmentalize it. So, oh, well, I think that's a cult. Why? Well, because they only believe the Bible. Well, that's right. We do. We believe the Bible. We believe that the, the sole authority, the singular authority is the Bible. Okay. It's not a, an opinion of somebody who has a whole lot of letters behind his name. It's what does the Bible say? That should make you feel safe. Because now you can see if whether or not what I'm showing you in the Bible is the same way in your Bible. Now, if everybody in here, and there would be enough to give every one of you a different translation, and then you're all looking, guess what it would be? It would be chaos. And so when, when we have a singular or a sole authority, and you preach from that authority, then you preach as one with authority. That has nothing to do with volume or how you present it. That's presentation. That's your oratory skills. And everybody's different. The guys that preach here, they're all different. None of them are the same. It has to do with the power that comes, comes from the book. And so the authority is, if you can imagine, just like we have the Bible over my head here, and I'm standing on it right here, and we have seven of them planted in the ground there. Preacher, why are we doing that? That just sounds kind of superstitious. No, it's... It's to give you an idea or an example that we're not here just doing things in our own mind. And you have to be careful not to get drawn away by people who have now tried because they don't have direction from the Bible to turn church into a social club. That's how you get people. And then if you're going to keep people, you have to do, number one, they'll step up their music. And then they'll step up their variety of the things that you can do, the opportunities that you have, and that kind of a deal. And before long, the Word of God's gone. There's no, there's no preaching. There's nothing that helping you with that. It's all about let's just have a good time, that kind of a deal. That's not what this is. I have a good time at church. Amen. 
I, I like being at church. I like being in church. I'm in church a lot. Uh, some people say, oh, I think you're in church too much. For me, I need to be in church. It's good for me to be there. It's good for me to stay busy. It's good for me to have my mind on those things. Um, and, and you say, well, but preacher, I, well, I'm, I'm glad you don't have the problem with a wandering mind. But because of what I did previously, and was exposed to a number of things. It's better for me to stay focused on what the Lord wants me to do. All right, so 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to give you just the first four or five points we went through, and then I'm going to move right into this. Father, would you please help us this morning, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, number one, I gave you this. If you're taking notes, uh, you, you should be hearing in a church, don't quit, don't give up, don't throw in the towel. If uh, throwing in the towel for most Christians was an Olympic sports, we'd all have a gold medal. The devil is trying his best to get you out. He can't make you lose your salvation, but he would love to get you away from a place where the Word of God is preeminent. And so whenever you're here, he doesn't care if you go somewhere else if the Bible's not preached. You say, why? The only thing that has an impact on the devil is Scripture. Amen. You don't have an impact on the devil. Right. He knew who Jesus was, not because he was his brother, as cults teach. He knew who Jesus was in the garden, at, well, I mean the wilderness of temptation in Matthew 4, but the Lord Himself used Scripture to rebuke the devil. So the thing that He hates is, is when Scripture is preached. That's why you don't see the interference that a lot of other places don't have, and you'll see interference here. It is because Scripture here is preeminent. That's the most important thing. It's the only thing that will give you order. And so the first thing you should look for is, is guess what? i got to learn not to quit. Uh, most people nowadays are taught how to win. Well, in the Christian life, you better get accustomed to losing. You say, why? That's how life is. But now that you're saved, it doesn't mean you're not going to lose. It doesn't mean you're always going to do everything right. It doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. It doesn't even mean you're not going to sin. It just means you're going to heaven when you die. So you have to learn how to lose. You have to learn that sometimes the track hoe gets stuck up to the seat and you can't get it out. You say, why? Well, because I'm a Christian. No, because that's life. Do you understand? All right. The second thing I gave you underneath that is found in verse number two. It's to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty there. Uh, you got to learn to be honest. Now, now listen, this is an important thing. You, you say, why? The hidden things of dishonesty are the things that you know you're not being straight up with. I'm not just talking about how you're doing business with people. The hidden things of dishonesty are the things that you know aren't right, but you're still doing them. And nobody else knows, but God knows. It's recognizing that, guess what? A church should be pointing me in the direction now that I'm saved of the judgment seat of Christ and to recognize I'm going to give an account for being out of fellowship with the Lord. And so I've got to learn to be honest with myself before I can be honest with other people. If you would learn to be honest with yourself, listen, you lie because you're a liar. Okay, so let's not just confess that we're lying. Let's say, Lord, I got a problem. I'm a liar. I'm quicker to say something that's a lie than I am to tell the truth. That must mean there's something wrong with me. So he says, renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Be honest. And then notice he says, not craftily. I would say you would put a note there to yourself that says, not only don't quit and walk right, I mean, and be honest, but walk right. Don't be craftily. Don't, don't be uh, smoke and mirrors. Uh, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be uh, one thing in church and another thing in the world. Right. Don't be trying to trick people. Right. Be straight up with people. Just be, just be honest with them. You know, I know some of you are thinking right now, so in the morning if my wife gets up and asks me if the dress makes her look fast, so I just fat, tell her, hey, uh, you, you look fat, you know. Well, let's, let's don't be stupid either. Amen. You have to figure out why it is she's asking you the question, but maybe you don't want to bring her chocolates home and for uh, lunch the next day. Not, 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 don't be, don't be, uh, don't, don't be sneaky. Don't have ulterior motives. If somebody gives you this long drawn out story about something, they're, they're, what they're doing is working an end and around and trying to just, just straight to the point. Okay. Uh, I think we're on number four now. Uh, remember this, that when it comes to handling the Word of God, and this has to do with you. Notice if you'll find that also in verse number two, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully. Don't use the Bible to lie to yourself. That's handling the Word of God to see. That's not just for preachers. 
That's for Christians. A preacher should instruct you on how to handle the Word of God. The Word of God, the first thing that you want to pick up on right off of Jump Street is, is it's likened unto a mirror. And when you look in that mirror, you're supposed to see how much unlike Christ you are. You have to recognize that. Don't handle it deceitfully where you put it on somebody else and you don't put it on yourself. You use the Bible to quote scripture at your wife, but then are you the husband you're supposed to be? Well, preacher, doesn't that Bible tell me that, I'm, that my wife is to submit to me and do what I'm supposed to tell her to do and all that? Yeah, it says that. It absolutely says that. Wives, obey your husband as, a, 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 as unto the Lord. And, and uh, the Bible teaches you also that uh, children are supposed to obey. Okay, but now here's the other thing. Husbands, love your wife if Christ loved the church. See, I just kind of like... <laughs> Well, yeah, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. True, as unto the Lord. You have a little hang up there? Come on in, Isaiah. You can sit down front, man. That's a walking testimony right there, man. <laughs> I'd be glad to have you on my six, man. Come on in, man. God bless your heart. What a blessing. Didn't expect it. Hey, Miss Tony. How are you? Good. Man, you look slim and trim. <laughs> Being sick been good for you. <laughs> How are you feeling? Better. Better? Yes, good. Thanks yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's a blessing. Keep, keep praying. Yes, sir. And don't overcook it. Okay. All right, so here's the thing. When it says don't handle it uh, deceitfully, don't apply it to somebody else when you don't apply it to yourself. It's not just looking for the, the guy in the pulpit that's giving you a lie. It's talking to you. Yes. Don't, don't take that Bible verse and say, well, you know, uh, the Bible says a little wine. Okay, how about the rest of the verse? <laughs> well, preacher, you know, in the originals, I don't give anything for the originals. <laughs> it said, for thy stomach's sake and often infirmities. And I can give you about 70 verses that tell you you're not supposed to be having alcoholic beverages. And you know better than to do it. See how you handle it deceitfully? Well, a little bit of wine, you know, at lunch and a little bit at dinner and a little bit at Christmas and a little bit for Groundhog's Day and a little bit for the next thing you know, you're just a drunk. Right? A little wine, that's talking about medicinal purposes. But now think about this in light of the Bible. If the Bible says that you're supposed to have your other brother, your weaker brother in mind, you have your weaker brother in mind when you run through the grocery aisle and you got three or four bottles of wine in the cart. That's real good. Come on. Say, but preacher, it's for, it's for what? Why don't you ask God to give you some other way of uh, getting healed up as opposed to drinking something? Because you say, oh, well, I got stomach trouble. <laughs> you must have a bad stomach, man. You got... <laughs> Seven bottles of wine there, you know, that kind of a deal. They're all different. If it's medicine, why isn't it one kind of medicine? Oh, well, you know, you've got to have a multitude of different things. Never know which one's going to work. <laughs> Do you understand? All right. And then the next thing you find, now, this is what you're supposed to be learning in truth. I mean, learning in the Bible. Handle God's word right. And then uh, you manifest the truth. We talked about this by how you live to every man's conscience in sight of God. How you live matters. You say, why? Because you are the only Bible that some people read. Whether you like that or not, it's what is it. Here, here's the big thing nowadays. On a regular basis, you know, uh, don't be judging me. Don't be judging me. Don't be judging me. Everybody judges. And as a Christian, you know what you better look for? They should be judging you. The only reason you don't want somebody to judge you is because you know you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> That's why when you go by on the side of the road and the guy's out there, looks like he's pointing something at you, and all of a sudden your foot comes off the gas. And if, you, if, you're, if he's in front of you, you tap that brake. You say, why? <laughs> I'm staying behind him. I'm staying behind him. Well, why not just come on and fly on by him if what you're doing is not wrong? Amen. I can tell you why. Your conscience has got you. Right? So the thing is, is that your testimony makes a big difference. It matters how you live and what you do. All right, and then we talked about this, and there's a reason for that, because the gospel is hidden. This is in verse number three, and people of sinners are blinded, and uh, the gospel still has the power that it's supposed to, but it's the message that's in there, not us. It's not the messenger. He gave us a light for why they can't see. 
I told you this the other day, and I gave you a few illustrations of it. I'll give you a few more of those. I told you that when you're dealing with somebody, you're dealing with another spirit. Paul gets over there, and the, him and Silas are getting ready to preach, and every time they get ready to preach, there's a woman that shows up there, and she's praying. But the timing of the prayer's wrong, and he says that she's possessed with a demon. Demons pray. You know that. Demons pray. Demons will pray at the wrong time, and they'll say all the right things. 2 Corinthians tells you that his ministers are ministers of righteousness, and no marvel, for the devil or Satan himself can disguise himself as an angel of light. So just because somebody's got a Bible, and just because they're quoting Bible verses, right thing, wrong timing, that's demonic. They'll quote verses to you. they quote verses out of context and different things like that. They disturb the natural flow of things. Uh, Peter's over there and they're getting ready. People are getting saved and so on and so forth. There's a boy over there known as Simon the Sorcerer. And he sees the power that they have as a real power. There's no gimmicks. There's no spin up to it. There's no uh, smoke and mirrors to it. And he says, I want what you got. And he takes out the money and he's willing to pay for that. And Peter says, I can tell you are in the gall of bitterness and thy money perish with thee. So people say, well, he, he got saved. No, he didn't. He was looking to get the power that came that they had so he could make more money. That's a demonic entity that's there. On a regular basis, the Lord comes down out of the mountain over there in Matthew um, 14. Uh, comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration and he gets down to the bottom of the hill down there and there's a boy down there that's uh, possessed of a demon and the Lord says to him, uh, this, come, this kind cometh out not but by prayer and fasting. He's dealing with a demon. Mount Mark chapter number 5, the Lord steps off of the boat. When he gets there, all of a sudden, here comes a man runs down. The Lord says, what's your name? And he says, my name is Legion for we're many. That's not the guy's name on his birth certificate. That's a demon talking to him. And what you have to recognize is, ladies and gentlemen, you have inside you the Holy Spirit, and if there is any time that you want to see the power of the Holy Spirit, it's when you're processing the gospel, when you're giving out the gospel. If you're really full of the Holy Ghost, you know the first evidence, you want to know the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Uh, it's that you process or that you, pro that you procure the gospel boldly. That's the first sign. It's not Ostrola, Shantai, Untai, Abotai, Economy, Honda, stuff like that. That doesn't have anything to do but point to you. The gospel's published to somebody else. That's the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when you're doing that, that's the Lord speaking through you. And you know what you're doing? You're talking to His owner. I told you on Wednesday night, when you're talking to His owner, you got the devil's full-blown attention. You say, why? I use the illustration. If somebody broke into your house and took your kid out of your house, wouldn't it upset you? And if you knew that he was there pawing at the window trying to get in, wouldn't you do something to protect the kid? You know what the devil will do? You want to get the devil's attention? You say, oh, well, I just, I, I, I'll just live right and do right and act right. He don't care about that. What he cares is when you use that influence on other people and you go after one of his kids. And when you go into the strong man's house, that passage is over there and he talks about that. You're going into the devil's house and you're taking one of his kids out. And guess what? That entity that's in that individual is going to be coming against you. <clears throat> so I told you, be gracious with the people when you're dealing with them, folks. Be kind and recognize some of the things they're saying and doing are because they're under the wrong influence. That's why they're acting out of character. It's not just because they're being jerks. It's because the devil is doing everything he can to blind them from seeing the gospel because if they see the gospel, he no longer has a hold on them. Do you understand? The devil, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, is the one that blinded the minds of them that would believe. The devil did that. It's in the passage. They don't see it because the devil's blinding them. And when you're there shining as a bright light, the Holy Spirit can break through that and catch a glimpse of that light. And guess what happens? They're going to attack you. And they're going to be upset or they're going to be rude to you or those kinds of things. So I told you about that and tried my best to explain it to you. So because God commanded the light, verse number six, to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glorious, uh, glory of God, the face of Jesus Christ. So they're in darkness and you represent light. So when you do that, you're facing somebody that has another entity in them. Now, you're going to think that's weird, but let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you are saved? 
All right, I think that's just about everybody in the room here. Now, let me say this to you. If you're saved, biblically, is not the Holy Spirit living inside you? Why do you think it's odd that the one that has them has a spirit living inside them? It's not just the spirit of man. It is direct opposition by the one that's their father. The Lord comes to him over there in the book of uh, John, and he says to him, and I guess it's uh, John uh, 4, he said, Ye are of your father the devil. The lust of him ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's talking to the religious people. They are completely blinded. And he said, you're of your father the devil. Well, if that's the case, I'm of my father, the, the Jesus Christ, is the father of God is in heaven. I got saved through Jesus Christ. I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. And if that's the case, I have a spirit in me. They have a spirit in them. You know what you have to do? You've got to get past all of the things that you're seeing out there and don't be taking it personal. People get mad here sometimes put the gospel out there and they get mad. I mean, I told you about the lady one time where I was preaching on hell and she got really mad and came back here and gave me the once over and the up, down and sideways and that kind of deal and said, preacher shouldn't talk the way you talk and gave me a big, you know, class and understanding and said, I've never heard any preacher ever mention the word hell so many times in a sermon. And I, I, I shouldn't have done it, but I said, thank you, ma'am. And she said, I beg your pardon. And I said, well, I was preaching on hell, so I guess you got the message. <laughs> man, she about broke the heel off her shoe, broke stomping the ground, man, turn around and walking off. You say, what is that? That's another spirit. Amen. Now, you can get another spirit. I don't have time to go in there, but you can't, act, you can't overdo the Holy Spirit if you stay walking in the Spirit. But an unsaved person can't walk in the spirit of the Holy Spirit. Right. Amen. They can walk in a demonic spirit. Sure. You have fellowship with the Lord when you're doing what the Lord have you to do. Is that right? Yeah. Some of you look shocked. They have fellowship with the demonic spirit. They're walking in the demonic spirit. Right. Right. That's why a lot of people do some of the things that they do. And you can listen. If you listen, you'll, you'll learn who they're walking with. Yeah. Come on. Think about how you talked last week. Who you walking with? Just something good. to consider. All right, now let's come to this uh, third part of this. We still got a little bit of time here. Now there's a price tag for the treasure that you got in you. You say, where does it start? Look in verse 8. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the carnal church in Corinth. You know what he says? After all these great things that you have comes with being saved, you know what a preacher is supposed to do? Warn you that, guess what? You're troubled on every side. Do you see it in the Bible? Now, if you come from another church, they don't tell you you have trouble. If you're having trouble, then, you know, God's blessings aren't on you. If you're not having prosperity, God's blessings aren't on you. If you're having health problems, God's blessings aren't on you. You don't have enough faith to be healed, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and goes on and on. The Apostle Paul says, we're troubled on every side. Yep. But then he tells you how you're supposed to handle that. Amen. See it in the passage? Sure. Look at it. It's right in the book. But what? Not... So if I'm going to have trouble, you know what happens? I'm trouble on every side. That means forward, sideways, sideways, and behind me. And Paul says, okay. Don't stress me out. I am de-stressed. <laughs> right? Yet not distressed. I'm not. I expect it. You have days without trouble? Praise the Lord. I slept really good last night. I was aware of no trouble at all. That's a Christian life. Okay, trouble comes. Okay, Lord, give me strength. Does the Bible say, now maybe I'll misquote it here. I don't think I will, but uh, doesn't the Bible say, I can do all things through Christ. That, okay. But you know what you don't know? You don't know if you can do that until the Lord puts a stress on you that, <laughs> that you've never been through before. Your hands are in the hands of a doctor. And he's telling you about mitral valves and putting clips in and closing off blood flow to your lungs and this and that and the other. And you act like you know and understand maybe possibly whatever. And you're just thinking, am I going to survive? That's what you're thinking. That's what he's thinking. You're going to take care of Miss Tony if something happens to me, preacher. 
Doctor, he, I mean, maybe he knows what he's doing, but if God doesn't fix it. Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, okay, Doc, I'm in your hands. Amen. I'm not distressed, Amen. but I'm troubled. Yeah. Trouble's part of it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with you when you're troubled. Amen. You're just troubled. Amen. Nobody knows. <laughs> right? That's a good song. Because everybody has trouble. The problem is, is when you let it stress you out. So I'm going through stuff, nobody... Oh, come on now, wait a minute. Now hold on. That's not true. All right, let's go a little bit further. This is, by the way, this is what a preacher is supposed to be teaching you. Amen. Amen. You come here any amount of time at all, you know what you hear? Trouble, 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 trouble. You say, why do you do that? So you're not surprised when it hits you. Amen. I can assure you it is coming to your doorstep. I can't promise you a million dollars. I can't promise you a new car. I can't promise you a good husband or a good wife. I can't promise you if you raise your kids up right, they won't go prodigal. I can't promise you any of that. I can promise you trouble. Amen. You say, why? That's what the Bible says. He not only stops there, look in verse number nine, persecuted. Really? You say, why does he put that in there of persecuted and uh, not forsaken? Why does he put that? Because sometimes we think when we're persecuted that the Lord forsook us. Isn't that what we think? Yes. I'm being persecuted because the Lord's not protecting me. Watch. First Peter. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son that's been wicked, ungodly, and terrible, and bad, and all that. No. Every son whom he receiveth. Sometimes persecution comes your way simply because you love the Lord. <laughs> Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice insomuch that you're partakers of Christ's sufferings. Amen. He said, don't think it's strange. That's First Peter. That's right out of your King James Bible. Why does he say that? Paul said, uh, listen, just because you're being persecuted, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So you get ready to try to live for the Lord. You try to hand somebody a track. And the first time, if you haven't done it in a while, and you reach in your pocket and you hand somebody a track and they push it away or get away from me with that stuff and all that, it's like, man, I'm trying to do right and I'm getting persecuted. The Lord said, good, you're getting persecuted for the right reason. Amen. Peter's over there. He knows a lot about persecution. Some of the persecution Peter got, he got because of his own stupidity. He about drowned at one time because of his own stupidity. He got his eyes off Jesus. But ladies and gentlemen, when Pete comes up there after he meets the Lord on the beach, he's over there in Acts chapter number 3, and they're getting over there, and they tell him not to preach the name of Jesus. We talked about that last week. And they say, don't preach the name of Jesus. Don't preach the name of Jesus. And he continues to preach it, and he gets the tar beat out of him for it. You know what he says at the end of that passage there, right before you jump in the next chapter? You know what he says right there? Ain't this a blessing that we're being persecuted for the right reason? You say, what is it? It's a good testimony. You must be saved. Amen. You don't have to be obnoxious. You just don't have to be a jerk. You don't have to be, you got to learn balance. Listen, you're not to use the Bible just to persecute what you don't like. And getting persecuted for that because all of a sudden that thing becomes salient. It protrudes. It, it stands out above other things and somebody else. It's you using the Bible. Listen, you're supposed to use a towel right now, not a sword. And preacher to you, why don't you preach on queers and this and that and the other? I don't know that we have any here. Right. I can preach on it. It doesn't put you under conviction at all. Right. Well, you know, we need a good message on that every now and then. Well, why? You got a problem with it? Amen. Why are you so focused on that all the time? Right. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> what are you, what, what are you, here's another good one. You get hung up on, uh, on women's clothing. Yeah. You never get hung up on men's clothing. You get hung up on women's clothing. If a man were to walk in here in a wife beater, you wouldn't think nothing of it. You'd be like, oh yeah, well, if I had big arms like that, I'd have a wife beater on too, you know. <laughs> That's a tank top for all you unintellectuals. <laughs> but, 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 but you let a woman come in here with her. Right, sure. You have a cow, man. Why? Too much focus on those kind of things. Whenever you are making a mountain out of a molehill, I can tell you this. <laughs> you're straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. That's what the Lord said. You're looking at all these, these things. They're wrong. There's no question about them. I don't get involved in the abortion issue. 
Oh, you believe in abortion? You're an idiot. If you want, pardon me, that's not very nice for Sunday morning. You're an idiot. <laughs> if you think I'm for that, how could you say that? I just, I'm not going to take time away from preaching the gospel Amen. to give you what the Bible says about abortion. Amen. Why? I'll deal with it when you time, time, your time comes. But until then, you think I'm going to throw that up the flagpole? Right. We had a, a full-blown crazy guy here that had a van painted with uh, fetuses and pieces of fetuses and stuff like that. Went down and uh, was uh, rejoicing over the fact that they put the guy that shot the doctor over in the Tallahassee. And then we're going to put him to death. And he goes down there. He actually spoke up that he was an associate pastor here at this church. <laughs> He did. It was in the news. I had him print a retraction, called him up and was pretty jacked up because they never checked their sources or nothing else. But here's the thing. You say, what was he doing? He was using your platform for his agenda to try to tie your authority behind it. We didn't do anything with that. The guy, you say, what did he do? He committed murder. What is he supposed to do? He's supposed to get the hot squat or the needle. That's what the Bible says. What are you going to do? Go down there? No, I'm not going to rejoice over it. They nuked Bundy? Good. Should have been done before all the years that he went going through appeals and stuff. Preacher, you're just kind of hard to it. No, you're just a fool about it. You don't have to make a big deal about those kinds of things. You say, what are they? They become salient, become important, and the next thing you know, you got a little uh, uh, telephone pole sticking out of your head while you're looking at somebody else who's got a splinter. You've got to be careful about that stuff. All right, let's go on just a little bit further here. Notice in the same passage, persecuted, not forsaken. He's telling, he's trying to let you know when you're persecuted, doesn't mean. Now watch, cast down. Yeah. Amen. You say, what is that? Would you agree with me that cast down is depression? Yeah. Sure. You know what can happen when you get cast down, when you get upset? Uh, you can allow it to destroy you. Whether you believe it or not, depression is a very real thing, and you can get down so far in that hole, it can drown you. Amen. And until Bible believers wake up and realize that just because you're a Bible believer, it doesn't remove you from the possibility that something so great can happen to you that it can stress you to the point that it's like, you know what, I'm so cast down, I'm so down in the mouth, I'm so upset, I'm so bothered, that it can just completely destroy you. And if it doesn't destroy your personal life, it'll destroy your spiritual life. But he says not destroyed. Why? He's a realist. Paul's a great preacher. It's time we recognize people actually have problems between their ears. Amen. And sometimes those problems are greater than physical pain. Yes. How you see something, how you think about something. Some of you folks, I could say this, I may sound a little edgy when I say it to you. You don't realize that sometimes when people are sick, they're going through things. Or if they're having chemicals pushed through them and things like that, right. you, got to, you don't have enough grace to fill a thimble. You say, what are they? they? They shouldn't be taking medicine. Well, you're not the one sick and they're having to take medicine because they're sick. And guess what? During that time, they act kind of bad. They'll destroy themselves if you're not careful. You can just pile on. Yes. Right. Right. Cast down. Depression. It's a real deal. Yes. You know, Walt Preacher, you know, I just think, well, thank God you don't have it. Yes. But you got enough fleas otherwise for people to know you're a dog. Yes. You may not have a problem with depression, but you may have a problem with a lustful eye. Yes. Come on, Preacher. Oh, but that's not the same thing. There ain't a pill for that. Yeah, there is. The gospel pill. <laughs> That'll cure you from what ails you. All right. Now, notice what he says here. You say, what happened? That's part of it. But he says, but not destroyed. Keep seeing the buts in there. That'd be a good, that'd be a good sermon. I got to think of the name. That'd be a good one. All right. Now, watch this one right here. Uh, verse number 10. This has to do with his own personal testimony. There's a continual dying to oneself. Verse 10, always bearing in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. How? Wow. That means I have to constantly die to what I want to do. Because it's right to do. I have to accept there nowadays the new word is, is I have to accept responsibility for my own actions. Bearing in the body. What is that? That's crucifying my flesh. I can, but I can't. That means you have to put God's will ahead of your will. I call that the Gethsemane experience. You needn't worry about Calvary until you go to Gethsemane. 
You say, why? You'll be fighting them nails. Gethsemane is where the Lord made the decision. In the Gethsemane, he says this. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. That's not what I want to do. I'm going to do what you want me to do. And he's not afraid of dying. He has life and death in himself. He's not afraid of dying. He said, not my will, but thine be done. And then for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You'll have a hard time enduring the cross until you surrender your will. You say, when is that? Well, if we follow the Apostle Paul, he's our apostle. He's the one that we're supposed to follow. He's our mentor, you might say. If we're going to follow the Apostle Paul, then you have to say, Paul had to die daily. Man, I can't even touch the hem of Paul's garment if what I read about the Apostle Paul in the Bible's right. If he has to die daily, I must need to die two or three times a day. Now, I don't know about you. Some days I'm better than others. But some days, it's like, I just killed you this morning. <laughs> what are you doing talking back to me that way? Oh, he, I resurrected. And you kill him again, and sometimes you have to kill him two or three times. You say, what is that? I bear in my body. People can see when you want to do something and you refuse to do it because it's just not right. A preacher is supposed to tell you that. A preacher is supposed to tell you, shacking up ain't right. Amen. Preacher, we live in a modern world nowadays, and nowadays things have changed. You just don't understand how things are. No, I understand how things are. I know what the Bible says. Well, I know what the Bible says. Thank God I'm saved. But things are just different nowadays. No, still wrong. You know, preacher, you know there's nothing really wrong with going to the club. I mean, you know, I know a lot of people that are saved, and when they were young, they did stuff, and so now I'm going to be young and all that. See? You ain't dead. Somebody sticks you. What's the natural response? The Lord says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. <laughs> Pray for your enemies. Mm. There it is. I got to be dead to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, that's the difficult thing. The difficult thing is, is that there is a constant struggle to make this guy right here die. Yep. Because even though you're saved, he still wants to rule the roost. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yes, sir. The second you take the cuffs off, man, he's just getting, they're, they're a little tight. If you could just... I mean, if you could just lose them a little bit, just, can I just get them for a second? The second you do, gone. Yep. Amen. Gone, gone, gone. And then you chase him down and you grab him and you tase him, whatever. You throw him down, you get him again, you hook him up. And then before long, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I won't ever do it again. But I, could, you just, could you just please let me go? I won't run away again. I just, and then you're like, well. There it is. <laughs> How many times did he lie to you? Amen. <laughs> well, I'm glad I have one that agrees with me. <laughs> he lies to me all the time. You know the only time I know my flesh is lying? It's when his mouth is moving. <laughs> he is always up to something. Brother Roy, would you let them in, please, if you would? I got a couple more minutes. I want to cover this last thing right here. Uh, now, here's the thing you have to understand. Uh, Sunday morning is supposed to be uh, like you getting up for uh, Resurrection Day. Do you understand? Yes. And so when you do that, the only way you can do what you, what God wants you to do and not what you want to do yourself, you can't just compare it to work. You get up every day to go to work. They pay you to go to work. And get up every day to go to school. They, you know, in a sense, they pay you to go to school. They give you grades. You graduate. You get a certificate. And then you can get a job and so on and so forth. That Bible says in Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your what? Bodies. Bodies. What kind of sacrifice? Living. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may know that which is good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Are you with me so far? Amen. You know what he just said right there? Uh, you present your body as what? A living sacrifice. That means always. Paul said, bearing in my body the marks of Jesus Christ in Colossians. So if that's the case, then what I have to learn to do is, I can't do what I want to do. i got to ask God. God, what do you think about this? Now, the last time you messed up, did you ask God first? Now, be honest. Don't, don't, don't say it out loud. Be honest. Didn't the Holy Spirit say to you before you did it? 
It's just like this right here. It's just like if you pick up this Bible right here in, uh, that I have in my hand right here, you pick up this Bible and you haven't ever read it before and you look and say it says King James, you pick it up. If you're saved, you know what the Holy Spirit said to you? You know that's the right book. Now you can decide to use your intellect or whatever else it may be or your method of choice, but the Holy Spirit bears witness to you when you start to mess up, doesn't He? Right. Yes, sir. Okay, now I can either do what He tells me is best for me or I can do what I want to do. There it is. That's how you bear it in your body. So they come up to you and they say, hey man, we're going to all get together, have a big barbecue and stuff like that. And we're all going to be, you know, uh, you know, we're going to shuck some oysters. That used to be a big thing back in the day. And we're going to watch the football game. We're going to have a tailgate party and all that kind of stuff. Uh, could I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, what kind of beverages are you going to have? Oh, I don't just, you know, a little bit of beer and a little bit of liquor, stuff like that. Nothing of any major consequence. I mean, you know, it's no big deal. Okay, thank you. No, thank you. He said, well, we're just getting together. You know, it's just, I mean, the people that are go there, they all go to church too. No, thank you. Right. Amen. You say, what is that? That's you bearing in your body because you know what you'd like to do? You like to be liked by them. Some of your friends are there. Yes, yep. You know what you'll do? You'll go and drink water. Come on. I saw a commercial yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Maybe it was the day before. I think it was yesterday I saw a commercial. It's got two young boys sitting out on the front porch. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, cable TV commercial. Got two young boys that are sitting on the front porch and they got two brown long necks sitting on the table. These boys can't be more than seven or eight years of age. Got two brown, and they've got the, the intentionally the label on the thing, they got it blurred out. Now I'm, I'm sure it's root beer. But they're giving you the impression it's two guys sitting down on the porch after a long, hot summer day, and they're having this discussion over a couple beers. And it's two young boys. And some of you think, okay, well, so what's the big deal? Well, you know what? If I have to explain that to you, you're just a fool. Amen. I mean, I can remember the day I went and got one of them little candied cigarettes thing, and I had the audacity to put it in my... I thought my dad was going to take my head off. I wasn't worried about losing my fingers. He was going to fix it where I never put another one of them things to my mouth. <laughs> it was candy, but it was white with a little red tip on it. And then I was fool enough, like I didn't learn my lesson, I went and bought a, a King Edwards or whatever it was, a bumblegum uh, uh, cigar. You know, and my dad looked at me, he's like, and I thought, I knew it was wrong. He said, Preacher, that's just so ridiculous. Okay. Well, just let a little more, a little more. You know what some of you do? You go to the restaurant because you so badly want to fit in, you won't have them pick up the wine glasses. You let people believe you normally take it, but right now you just decide not to. Or you let your kids have drinks with different colors in them, you know, with some cherries on top and put a little umbrella in there and all. It's called a virgin. It won't be virgin long. You wait till that person turns about 15 or 16. They'll make sure they get a little extra in there. You say, what? They learned it from you. Amen. I mean, you know, I mean, you hypocrite. You do it at home. You do it when you're out on Come a business. On. Well, that's business. Yeah, that's business, you know. Yeah, that's business. You say, you got to do business. You got to do that to do business? No, sir. Well, you must be awful hard up. Yep. Something's wrong with you. Now, here's what I'm doing. I'm intentionally offended you. You say, well, that's what a preacher's supposed to do. Amen. Amen. And some of you, you don't appreciate it at all. Your skin's crawling. You look like you got bees in your britches. You're kind of like, well, why is he on that? The other place I go, they don't ever talk about that kind of stuff. Come on. But you see, the Bible says you're supposed to do that. Yes. So if I'm going to go with the Bible, which I'm going to over you, because yes, I love you, Amen. I know. <laughs> Paul said he gets in a, in a tight spot, and I'll quit with this. Paul said, uh, um, you know what? Uh, I love you, and I'm going to tell you the truth. Why are you hating me? I'm trying to help you. Amen. And I know, well, we can talk about gossip and all that. Come tonight, we'll get on all those things, okay? <laughs> we have something for everybody. Variety is a spice of life. <laughs> Father, bless your word. Be with us in the upcoming service.